Hey, this is exciting. This is super exciting. This is our very first all region FCA huddle. It's happening during a pretty time of crisis, during a time of crisis. It's happening during a time of uncertainty and there's a lot of chaos in our minds and hearts and a lot of big question marks, but it's happening and that's exciting. Our first, our first huddle, our, our statewide huddle. That, that, that's great. I know we've got ministry partners from Texas. We've got ministry partners from Georgia and from Florida, from across Latin America South. And I, and, and I know there are some from Israel as well. So how much fun is this? Not only is this exciting, but what's real exciting about it is that the, the greatest football coach of all time is with us. A, a, a coach that, that I have so much respect for, a man of God, a true, true man of God, Coach Bobby Bowden. Coach Bowden, I've known for, for about 10 years. We've been doing ministry events together for, for a while. I shared some donuts together even and, and uh, some, some sun-kissed and, and, uh, and uh, peanuts all mixed together, which I learned from Coach Bowden. And I'm only going to eat that with Coach Bowden no other time. Uh, but truly, this is, a, this, this is a, a remarkable event and a great time for us to be together. I'm going to introduce a couple people, one person to you, and then, and then we're going to transition. But before I do that, I want to pray. I want us to pray to begin our huddle. And then I got a story to tell. It's a Coach Bowden story that most people, almost nobody has ever heard. It's not written about in a book. And uh, I'm excited to tell you that story. So let's pray. Father in heaven, God, thank you. God, thank you, Lord, for region-wide huddles and, and time for, for FCA to be together. But it's not truly that we desire FCA to be together. That's an exciting point, of course. But, Father, it's exciting to see your church be together and to see you glorified. God, thank you, Lord, for this next period of time that we get to spend uh, together through this virtual huddle, which is, which is fun. And God, I pray, Lord, that you would be speaking to each person listening uh, around the globe to this, to this meeting, to this huddle meeting right now. Lord, we love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So in 2012, a moment I will never forget. Really, it, it truly is. This is a moment I'll never forget. I walked into a coach's office in North Dade, a coach by the name of Lamont Green. You probably all remember Lamont. I walked into this coach's office and, uh, and, and sit down in this North Dade high school coach's office. And I sit down and he's got this, 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 this football um, up behind him. And it's in this case and it's locked down. So I sit down and I look and I did what anybody else would have done. I said, hey, coach, tell me about that ball. Tell me about that football right there. And Lamont gets up from the desk. True story. Gets up from the desk, walks around me, goes and shuts his door. Now I'm like, oh, my goodness, what is he going to say? What is happening? Shuts the door, comes back, sits down at the desk, and he puts his and he gets his, his arms down. He can't see, but gets his arms down and gets real in. And I can see his eyes well enough. He goes, that's the ball that Coach Bowden gave me. That's the football he gave me. We just won a national championship. And Coach Bowden handed me this ball. And now it sits behind him. He goes, there's a story about the ball. I'm like, okay, you got me. I'm in. Tell me the story. Tell me all you can about it. You know, so I'm, I'm leaning in and this guy's leaning in and uh, our, our director down at the time, Noel Wilbanks, uh, was leaning in. I don't know if he'd ever heard the story either. And we're sitting there and you're sitting there at the coach's office. And he said, we just won the national championship and the players were sent home. So I headed, to, I headed to North Dade. I headed down here to, to, to Miami, to my home in North Dade. I got off the plane. I, like he was, I got home late at night. And I'm holding the ball in my hand. I went to bed with my football that my coach gave me. Went to bed with my football. And I'm laying in bed. You know, my mom had greeted me at the door. My grandmother was there greeting me at the door. And I went to bed. And she goes, early in the morning, like, like, like breakfast time early. Just got off the plane, middle of the night, gets, gets home. Early in the morning, there's a... <laughs> knocking on his door <laughs> sorry that's my dog uh, not, not knock, knocking on his door and, and he goes mom what's wrong what's wrong and his mom goes there's a big car outside there's a big car outside and he goes he looked out the window and sure enough there was a big car outside and he sees coach coach Bowden getting out of the car and and heading to his house 
to his small house there in, in North Dade, headed into his house. Well, he thinks the coach is coming to take back the ball. He's like, he goes, I wanted to hide the ball, but I grabbed the ball. And he goes, I ran to the door. He opened the door even before coach could, could ring the doorbell. And coach looked at him and said, he goes, he goes, son, I'd like to have breakfast with you tonight, this morning. I want to have breakfast with you this morning. And he sat down and had breakfast with his, with his player. Just him, his mom, and, his, and, and Coach Bowden together. And he learns during the breakfast time that Coach Bowden was going to go spend a meal, uh, some sort of a meal, with every player that he had that he knew didn't have a daddy at home. That's Coach. That's Coach Bowden. I loved Coach Bowden before this, before I heard that story. But after I heard that story, I got to tell you, the love that I had for her and him went deep into my heart. A coach loving his players, being the father figure, and spending that time. You know, Florida State University, I don't know. There must have been quite a few players on that team that didn't have a daddy at home. But Coach Bowden was going to go have a meal with every one of them. Fantastic. Thank you, coach. I love you very much. You're a good friend. Another good friend that I want to introduce right now is a player for, for Coach Bowden, a uh, guy by the name of Kez McCorvey. You guys know Kez. He says that, that he is Coach Bowden's favorite all-time receiver. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but, but, but he was a great receiver for Florida State. Kez uh, is on staff with FCA and uh, has been working in our North Florida office for uh, go, going on four years now. Kez serves as a multi-area director. He covers a large territory, is doing a phenomenal job, and won the national championship with Coach Bowden in 1993. <laughs> the, the best national championship team. Is that what he's trying to tell me? The best national championship team in 1993. And you know, I never got to play for a coach like Coach Bowden. Um, but in a sense, I feel like I do right now. Love you, Coach. Thanks, Kez. All right. All right, guys. Hey, uh, how you guys doing? Uh, my name is Kez McCorvey, North Florida Director for FCA. I'm excited to get a chance to come here and, and actually uh, get an interview coach, basically. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to ask Coach a couple of questions. And he has, I'm sure he'll, he'll elaborate and talk about all different types of things. But I'm going to uh, hopefully get a chance to have conversation and just kind of hear his heart uh, and as he speaks about uh, uh, all the things that uh, that are, are important to him. I I, I know for myself, I, I feel the same way too as well. I uh, a broken kid from Mississippi coming over to Florida State, and when you get, I, I don't, I'm not sure if he knew what he was getting when he got me, but you know, with the atmosphere that he set on that campus, the atmosphere that he set within the context of that football program, it it impacted me. It impacted me. I've been married for 25 years. Uh, and I, I believe it's in due to the uh, relationship I have with Coach. I have a son, <laughs> and he's been influenced by Coach Bowden. You know you've been influenced when your son has been influenced. As a matter of fact, the other day he was playing a game, and, and I think he, he, he didn't win, and so he got mad, and all of a sudden all I heard was, uh, 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 Dag Nabbit? <laughs> I said, man, where did it come from? I came from Coach Bowden. That's a good old Dag Nabbit. <laughs> and so we're going to hopefully have some fun. I'm going to just basically just ask Coach a couple of questions and let him go. Let him, I want you, I, my goal is for you guys to feel his heart and hear uh, a lot of the wisdom that I was, a, I was a privy to as a player and as a friend of his too as well. I, 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 take that, I don't take that lightly. I've been a friend of his uh, after football. And I want you guys to be able to partake in some of that wisdom that he has that he wants to share with us, okay? So we're gonna get started, okay? We're gonna get started. So uh, basically, uh, Coach, I, what I wanted to ask first question, okay? And knowing the situation we're in now, as a ball coach today with the unprecedented, unprecedented situation of COVID-19, uh, with the uncertainty of the seasons, uh, the sports culture as we know it, what are, what are some things you would do and what message would you uh, would you present to your players and the, the fan community that, uh, that, that, that you would have access to? 
I'll tell you one thing I'm going to do with this. I would, I would try to impress on them and show them again that God is in control. I would try to show them and get the message to them, which I think a lot of them would already know that uh, God's more God's more powerful than all of us and that we need him. Now, that's something I tried to talk to y'all about when you were playing, that there was a higher spirit and you needed to get that spirit behind you because it is the spirit that drives us. I mean, if you don't have spirit, you don't have anything. You know what? And uh, and uh, I would I would come at you from that angle. And again, now with this crisis, you know a thing about a crisis like this, it either draws you closer to God, or it draws you away from God. And I feel sure there are going to be a lot of people. I feel like will be saved maybe because this is happening, and they see the power of our Almighty God. Now, I don't think God started this, but I do know he let it happen because <laughs> I know he could stop it with a snap of a finger or the blink of an eye, you know, but God gave man uh, the ability to judge, to make his own decisions, you know, and of course, being able to make our own decisions, thank goodness we have men in America and ladies here in America that know enough science to know how to solve this thing, it'll take time, but they'll get it done. And it'll end up being another miracle of, of God, you know it? But, uh, but I wanna say beside that, how important the fellowship of Christian athletes is to me. Because Kez, I saw more young men and women change their life through the fellowship of Christian athletes than any other institution I can think of, except maybe the church, you know it? And so I've, I've, I've always been a firm believer in the fellowship of Christian athletes. And we must remember, it's not the fellowship of athletes, it's the fellowship of Christian athletes. So we, so we must not be ashamed to talk about Christ, you know it? We must not be ashamed to talk about God and talk about Jesus because it, it's, it's because of them that we're here. Absolutely. Because thank you. Hey, I, 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 and I want the second question I have is this right here. I, you know what? I, I watched the uh, the Bowden Dynasty. Who watched? I don't know. I'm sure everybody in America has watched the Bowden Dynasty, but I watched it and I learned some things about you that I didn't know before. And first one is this right here. I didn't know that you were a baller, Coach. I didn't know that you could that you could play and get down like you, like I heard you could on the, on the video, man. I, I, I didn't, man. And so <laughs> that was cool. I didn't know. I, hey, my coach can ball. And so, but I also learned this right here. I learned uh, uh, about your uh, how you came to your faith in in your youth as yeah. well. Oh, and, yeah. the, and the circumstances that kind of caused that too as well. Can you can you talk about that? Yeah, uh, you're you. Sure can. Kez, uh, my, 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 my walk with Jesus Christ is different from most people. You know, I meet people nowadays that say, oh, when I was 18, I became saved. Or when I was 12, I became saved. Or I, I wasn't saved till I was 50, you know? And people are saved at different times. Now, when did I learn about Jesus? I can't ever remember not knowing about him. I mean, I was raised in a Christian home where you went to church every Sunday, and I always knew about Jesus. I just didn't realize the plan that God had given us with his son, that God sent his son down here to give his life on the cross. He died on the dadgum cross, man. Can you think of that? Nailed to a cross all day long and died, God said, for our sins. If you and I would believe that and accept that and accept Christ as our Savior, he would save us, you know? Now, people wonder, what does, what does it mean when you say you're saved? Saved from what? Well, it's kind of like this. You know, I'm 90 years old now. I don't know, I don't know how many years I got left. I didn't, I didn't expect a God to give me 90, but he did, you know? What? But I know this, that when the time comes for me to go, 
I'm ready to go because I have prepared myself for that trip. Well, we must realize that our place down here on earth, that's, that's just a trial. That don't count, man. You know what? Because everybody will eventually die and then they'll either go to heaven or I hate to say it, to hell. You, know, you don't hear much about hell anymore. You know what? You know why? Because people are afraid to talk about it. It is so bad. Jesus talked about it. Jesus talked about it more than he did uh, uh, the, the, the going to heaven, you know, and he described it as a river of fire. Now, whatever that means, that don't sound good. But I don't have to worry about it, Kez, because I have asked God to forgive me of my sins. You say, you know, when I say I'm a Christian, I'm not saying I'm better than anybody. I'm not saying I'm better than you or anybody else. I'm just saved, you know. And uh, uh, I've accepted Christ as my Savior. I have asked Jesus to come into my heart, you know, and that, and that I promised God I would try to follow him. You know, let me, let me tell you what God did. If you don't think God's alive, listen to this. When I was 13 years old, I played ball all the time with my buddies out in the yard. You know, and, but when I was 13, one day I was walking home from practice. My knees were killing me. I got home and said, Mama, my, my, my knees are just killing me. She took my fever at a real high fever. She called the doctor. The doctor came to my house. Back in those days, the doctor came to see you. You didn't go see them. You didn't go to the hospital. They, we came right by your house. And he saw, he said, son, you've got rheumatic fever. And he put me in bed. And I'll never forget, I sat up on the pillow. He said, get down on your back. I don't want you sitting up. Because it was a heart disease. And he didn't want me doing anything that might strain the heart. And I laid there in that dadgum bed for about six months, flat on my back. You know what? And uh, I had prayer one time. I remember I had prayer with my mother. My mother walked in the door and, and she asked me, she said, Bobby, do you believe in prayer? I said, yes, mother, I believe in prayer. And so she said, why don't you ask God to heal you? I said, mom, I do, you know, but I prayed to God, God, if you will heal me, I will try to serve you the rest of my life. Because you see, back when I was growing up, 1943, the expected life average of, uh, of rheumatic fever was 40 or 45 years old. Of course, when you're 13, you say, oh, that's a long time. You, you don't even think about it. Well, now I'm 90. <laughs> that makes 40 young. You guys that are 40 are young, I'm going to tell you. But anyway, I asked God to heal me and that I would try to serve him the rest of my life. Well, in two years, I got, a, I got an examination, Birmingham, Alabama Medical School, and they examined me, and the doctor said, Bobby, your heart is good. You got some scar tissue on it, but if you want to play ball, you go play ball. See, I couldn't play ball up to then. They wouldn't let me do anything like that. So I went out for the football team, played two years of high school ball at Woodlawn High, and then I went to the University of Alabama, stayed one semester, got married. Back in those days, if you got married, you couldn't have a scholarship. So I transferred up to Sanford University, and played four years of football up there. I was a quarterback, you know? And uh, so anyway, God answered my prayer, Kez. You know what? And then, just to show, then let me tell you what happened. I coached for 56 straight years. I, in 56 years, I had six different jobs at four different schools because I came back to two of them twice, you know? So I, I had 46 jobs. I did not apply for one of them. Now, aren't you supposed to apply to get a job? Well, sure. People don't just call you and say, well, hey, we want to hire you. <clears throat> you have to apply. But I didn't apply for these, you know. Now, I applied for some jobs I didn't get. I got turned down. Every time I'd apply for one, I get turned down, you know what? But these jobs were give, handed to me, you know. Who was that? That was God answering my prayer. The last football I gamed at Sanford, 
played at Sanford University. The athletic director came up to me after that year. He said, Bobby, if you'll go get your master's degree, we'll hire you here as assistant coach. Oh boy. So I went and got my master's degree and they hired me as assistant coach. Up to that time, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I hadn't decided I wanted to be a coach. I didn't even think about it. You know, my dad was a realtor and he wanted me to come in there with him. I thought, figured that's probably what I would do. But gosh, I got a job, we ought to take it. So I started coaching my first year out. I coach here two years. I get a phone call from the president of South Georgia College. I ain't never heard of him. Bobby, would you be interested in a head coaching job at South Georgia? A head coach? Dad gum right, I'd be interested. Come down for an interview. I go down for an interview, get the job. I coach here four years. We win three state championships. Come out second, I think the fourth year. And then the, the president comes in and says, Bobby, we're going to have to drop football because we're all losing money. So all the junior colleges that played football in Georgia dropped football. You know what? Now I only coach football. Co the president said, you can stay here as athletic director and head baseball coach. Yeah, but I want to coach football. It wasn't two weeks later. It's been so long ago. I, it it might've been one week later. I get a call from Sanford University. We're looking for a head football coach. Would you be interested? Yes. I go up for the interview and I get that job. You know, that's the fourth job I got that I didn't apply for, had no idea. And they, and they hired me. Out of all the jobs I got, I guess I got a raise. I, I made more money. I started off at $3,800, $3,800 a year. I finished with two and a half million a year, which is no record, but wasn't bad back when I, when I got that, you know? But there, there is no doubt to me, God is alive. People better understand that. And God will answer your prayer. But you know, God says in the Bible, you don't have because you don't ask. How about that? You don't have because you don't ask. Well, ask. Hey, I ask. <laughs> I ask and I receive, boy. You know what? Now, I asked for a lot of things I didn't get. I got a lot of no's. You have to realize that's when you ask God, he might say no, you know what? But don't think that ain't an answer. No's an answer, you know what? But uh, God, I mean, I'm, 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 you're hearing firsthand, not second or third hand from somebody you never met, what God can do. You're hearing from right off the mouth of the guy that it happened to, you know what? And mm -hmm. I am thankful to God to this day. Awesome. You know, the way he blessed me, gave me a wife. Anna and I have been married 71 years. Now, that's a miracle. <laughs> yeah. Anybody married will say, God, in the world, you stayed married for 71 years. I don't know. But Anna and I loved each other. We still do today. And like I say, 71 years have gone by, you know, and we're, we're looking for more. But uh, gosh, God has been so good. Now, here we are and got our nation. In, a, in an emergency, killing a lot of our people, killing a lot of our people. I, I wish every American American would get down on their knee and ask God to heal this virus. You know, and I, th I think we're gonna eventually solve it through our drugs and through the great doctors and physicians and, and scientists that we have nowadays. But you know, God could do it just like that if he, would just, if he would. But maybe maybe we Americans need to ask him, you know, and let him answer. Anyway, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Oh, Coach, I, I love that story. I, I recall the first time I heard you speak about that. You were speaking at a, a, a coach's clinic. It's about 5,000 uh, coaches in the audience, and I'm in the audience, too. And so, but I'm in the audience thinking to myself, I know Coach Bowden. <laughs> I know Coach Bowden, hey, I'm, but it's 5,000 people in the audience and every coach at, the, at those clinics, the first, the only thing, I mean, the one of the main things they're looking for is this right here, is how do I get a better job? And I recall you coming into that meeting and you speaking to those guys about that. Okay, this is my story. You told that exact story you just told, right? Yeah. But then yeah. you also added to it this right here. You said, you said this right here, and it's a diamond that I keep with me, not only in football, but in life period. And you told, you said, don't worry about the next job. Worry about being excellent 
at the job you already got and the next job will take care of itself. Kids, I still stick by that today. I still, yes. still, I mean, I, a lot of times I see coaches trying to get ahead, trying to get ahead, always looking ahead. One another job. That ain't the way to get a job. The best way to get a job is work as hard as you can where you are. Treat that job like it's the last job you'll ever have. Work each day like it's the last day you'll ever live. And you'll get another job. Absolutely. You'll, you'll succeed. And someone will ask you to come work with me. Absolutely, Coach. And I think that's that's not only in football, that's in life period. Oh, I sure. Think that's, sure it is. It's, it's in life period. Let me go this right here, Coach. This is this is a, 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 a really a great story. And I want to lead into it right. I, I recall when I first got to Florida State, I'm a young a freshman, you know, don't, you know, wet behind the ears and all that kind of stuff. I get on campus. And I, 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 I'm really just trying to figure out how to fit in. But I keep hearing a story. I keep hearing a story about a guy named Pablo, all right, and from the upperclassmen. And I, I don't know who Pablo is at all, right? And, 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 so, and so I'm asking the upperclassmen, who is Pablo? Who is Pablo? Coach, can you, can you elaborate on the Pablo Lopez story? Sure, sure I can, man. Uh, this was back in the mid-70s. Here at Florida State, we had an open date. That means we didn't have a game this week. We got one the next week. Anytime I had an open date, I would let my boys go home. I'd work. I'd practice Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and let the boys go home Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Now, there's some of them that live so far away, they couldn't go home because by the time they got there, it'd be time to be back. One of them was Pablo Lopez. Pablo lived in Miami, Florida. And he was a starting tackle on our football team. I'd say Pablo at the time was about 6'5", about 255 or 60 pounds. And he started at Florida State University. Well, we had that open date. So Pablo didn't go home. So Friday night, I mean, Saturday night, no, Friday night, Pablo went to a party. With, a, with some of the players that were on campus. I think about 10 boys probably stayed on campus. So Pablo goes to a party. He gets an argument with a little bitty guy. Now, Pablo, I told you how big he was. This guy was about five foot seven or eight, 130 pounds. And they were arguing, but it was, ver it was verbal, not physical. But the little guy get mad. He got mad and he went home and got a dadgum shotgun. And he came back to the party and he stuck that shotgun right up against Pablo's chest. They said the last thing Pablo said was, you wouldn't shoot me with that, would you? And that kid pulled the trigger and shot Pablo right in the chest and knocked him flat on the ground. They called 119. The, the ambulance came and rushed him to the hospital. Our players that were there, some of them had their dates with them followed the ambulance to the hospital, never thinking that Pablo might die. You know, young people don't die. Only old people die. You, you know, that's what young people think, you know. So anyway, I get a call that night about 1 2 o'clock. Coach Bowden, you need to get over to the hospital. One of your boys is here and he's hurt bad. So I got up and got dressed, went to the hospital, took probably about 25, 30 minutes. And when I walked in the hospital, one of the first people I saw was the doctor. And he just looked at me and shook his head and said, Bobby, Pablo is dead. Golly, man, Pablo is dead. Man, what, what am I going to tell my players? They're not ready for something like this, you know? So we, we called our team back into a, a, a little room back there and, and, uh, and, 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 and shut the door where I had only my team in there and some of the girls. And uh, we told them, I told them Pablo was dead. They pitched a fit. I knew they wasn't ready for that. They pitched a fit. The girls pitched a fit, hollering, screaming, kicking on the floor, laying on the floor, beating on the floor, you know what? And finally, when they settled down, I said, hey, men, tomorrow, two o'clock, up in the coaches, up in the players' all, players' room, we're going to have a meeting, everybody, because all the boys that went home, we told them to be back by two. So the next day at two o'clock, we're 
sitting in our team room where I had, remember I had 11 seats across the front where the first team offense sat. Then I had 11 seats behind them where the first team defense sat. Then 11 seats behind them the second team offense. And then the second team defense, third team offense, all the way till I could seat about 125 boys, which was all of our players. Now by seating them like that, if I saw an empty seat, I knew exactly who was missing. And it just happened we had one extra seat. I'll never forget it right there. That's where the tackle sit. Pablo was missing. I thought it was be an excellent time for me to witness to my players. See, I tried to witness to my players. I knew, I knew, I know that's not politically correct, but I ain't interested in politically correct. I'm interested in being spiritually correct. I'm interested in being biblically correct. So I thought it was a good chance for me to witness to our players. And so I, I, I pointed to that empty chair. I said, hey man, where's Pablo? I just wanted to get them thinking. Where, where's Pablo? He was sitting right there yesterday. Where is he? I wanted to get them thinking about, yeah, where is he? You know, I wanted to get them, give me a chance to talk to them about life after we die. Life after we die, you know, what they must do to be saved and go to heaven, you know, instead of the other place. And I gave them a good talk to about that. I gave them a good witness. We left. Everybody went back to the boys, went back to get dressed. I went to the office. I went and sat behind my desk, closed the door, went in my office, sat down behind my desk, just like I'm sitting right here. Somebody knocked on my door. I told them to come in. They came in my office and it was one of my coaches. And he walked down and stood right there on the corner of my desk. I'll never, I'll never forget it. He looked at me, he said, coach, what were you talking about in there? I never heard that about eternal life and about life after death. So I, my mama's Bible was on my desk. Mama died and I got her Bible and I took her Bible and I showed him what he had to do to be saved. And right there in my office, he accepted Christ as his savior and he and I prayed about it. That guy's one of the best Christian men. That, that, that's been 25, 30 years ago. He is one of the best Christian men I know today. You know, anybody who tries to follow Jesus, it's, it's him, you know, and, and that's, uh, that's the guy that later on became the head coach at the University of Georgia and the head coach at the uh, University of Miami. And now he's re retired from that, working with television and uh, a, gr a great young man. But, but y there's no telling how many players have accepted Christ because of Pablo's death. You know what? Because I've heard a lot of boys bring it to my attention down through the years. And I know that Mark Rick, the coach, has uh, no telling how many people he has witnessed to and had had them accept Christ as their savior. That's the story of Pablo. It's a, it's actually, it's an awesome story too. I, I, I love hearing you tell the story because it, it, it rings true. I know as, as an athlete myself too, you, you come in and, and you have the prowess on the field and you think you're indestructible. Ah, yeah. You're not, you're oh, not. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes, and sometimes God uses those things, just like now we use those things to kind of show us to shake us up enough to know that you know what I'm not indestructible. Yeah, right. I'm not well, indestructible. You know, I, just like I mentioned a while ago, Kaz, it, it's only not normal. But I was the same way when I was young. You don't think you're gonna die? Some old guys. Those old guys are gonna die. You know, I've lost two dadgum grandsons. One of them was uh, one of them was thirteen. One of them was thirteen. The other one was twenty-three. Just graduated from Florida State. Didn't even get to walk across the state. You know, they were not old. They were young. You know, it can happen to anybody. And you know, whatever. If you don't mind me saying this, what everybody's goal in life should be. Every human being, and most of them are not, but there are a lot of them that are. What their goal in life should be, not to be a great player, not to be a great politician. Not to be a successful man or woman, but the number one goal is that when I die, I'm going to heaven. 
That should be your goal in life. You're not, you're not a success. You're not, if you, if you don't go to heaven, you ain't a, you ain't a success. I don't care if you made a billion dollars down on earth. I don't care if you was the number one man and woman in America. That don't mean nothing if you don't go to heaven, you know, when you die. So like I say, everybody should pray, God, save me, Lord, so that when I die, I, I will go to heaven and be with you. You know, that was always my prayer. Absolutely. You no, know, God, you know, God says, says over and over in the Bible, you don't get because you don't ask. He says that. The reason you don't get is you don't ask, you know? Well, you don't tell, you don't tell me that. <laughs> I'm ask, I ask him all the time, you know what? God has answered so many of my prayers. Uh, he's turned me down a lot more than he said yes, you know? But God, God loves us. God created you, he created me, he created everybody, you know? And he wants everybody to succeed, you know? Well, put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ Boy, your options, she'll pick up. Absolutely. All right, Coach, I, I love that story too as well. I, I, and what I'm going to do is this right here, is I'm going to bring uh, Jason Burnick back real quick, and I want him to kind of elaborate on the, the gospel uh, a little bit too as well, because I, I think this is, it's, it's important. It's important to follow up because exactly what you said, yeah. this is the most important decision the person can make in, the, in, the, in their life yeah. right here. So I'm going to bring Jason on real quick to kind of elaborate. Um, but uh, so don't go anywhere yet, coach. Um, uh, really appreciate that. Appreciate you, that story over the years of hearing you speak and hearing you share your, your heartbeat. And uh, I know I told you this before we got started, coach, but I, I love you. <laughs> I love you. You're, you're, you're such a, such a tender hearted man and in such a joy to, to listen to. I'm going to close us up here, but um, but don't go anywhere because we're not done with coach here quite yet. But I'm just going to wrap up some things that you already heard coach talk about. Uh, just some things that uh, to, just to clarify and, and make sure that things are that, that you understand. Uh, right now, uh, with everybody listening, with all the people that are, that are listening to this and who will listen to recorded versions of this in the recent history, but everybody listening, this is such an unprecedented time in history uh, because of COVID because of the virus, because of, because of whatever, but I need you to get this. All of us, those, the, the, our little short panel, as well as everybody listening, all of our staff uh, across, our, across our region, every coach, all the athletes, all the community, you donors and board members who, who are involved, everybody that's listening right now, I gotta tell you something, you got a lot of question marks going on in your head. You're dealing with, you're dealing with some fear. You're dealing with a lot of chaos. You're, you're wondering a lot about layoffs. You're wondering a lot about, about health. You wonder a lot about your family that you can't see. I have a grandmother that, that, I, that I can't see because, because she's, in, a, she's in, a, in an assisted living. And my mother and my father can't get in there to go, to go, to go see her. I can't get on a plane to go, to go over to her. Even if I could get on a plane to go over to her, I couldn't go in there to give her a hug. She's fine, praise God. But I'm just telling you right now, we're in a weird time and everybody listening has there's some brokenness going on there is watch the start watch the stock market for mark market just for a moment and it's a difficult time so i want you to listen in that brokenness in that chaos in those all those question marks that you have going on in your in your, in your heart and your mind right now i need you to pay close attention to this and, and we actually, we're going to share a screen with you here just so you can see something, uh, just to help diagram out just what I want to share with you. And this is vital. This is important. It's why, it's why, it's, it's why Coach got on the call with us. And by the way, and that is, I need you to grab this, that God loves you. There's a God, a Father in heaven, who loves you. He created, as a matter of fact, in Genesis chapter one, uh, it says that you were created in, in his image. You were made. You weren't a mistake. That God in heaven loves you and he made you 
we know the famous John 316 made famous by Billy Graham and, and uh, made famous by all the signs you see at football games holding up the sign that says John 316 that 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 God loves you but God 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 loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you we know that verse grab this because in the midst of all that chaos and the hurt and your chest is pounding and you're wondering about tomorrow get this closely you were made in love and you were created by a creator there's a problem and in this so if you look at that diagram there you see that heart that said he loves you and then to the right of that is a thing that looks like a looks like a division sign and in a sense it is we are divided we are separated from god that's a problem because sin separates us he loves us but sin is separating us and we're all guilty there. Romans 3.23 says that all sin and, and fall short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. As a matter of fact, that separation that's there is not something that I made up or FCA made up or whoever made up. Isaiah 59 says that our sin has made a separation between man and God, between us and God, between you and God. Our sin, it, it goes on to say our sin has caused him to hide his face from us. Oh, but Romans 3.23 says that, or 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death. But the verse doesn't stop there. The wages of sin are death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And that's the cross. See, sin does not stop God from loving you. There's a separation there, but you were made in love. Made in love, great in love. He loves you. There's this break, but the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. That cross brings you eternal life. It makes you whole again. Sin did not stop him from loving you. In Romans 3.23, it says that you have that eternal life. And in Rome, it goes on later in Romans to say that God proved his love for us. That while we were still sinners, not while we got everything right, not while the stock market was perfect, not while our, our wives, our husbands, our kids all loved us, not while everything was checked, not, not while that day went by that, that we got to wear a three-piece suit, not, not while everything was perfect, that, but, but that, in, that, that, that God proved his love that while we were sinned, in our sin, in the chaos, in the COVID virus, he died for us. He died for you. Not when you had everything perfect, but while you were broken. See, God loves you. There's a problem, and that's that we're separated from him. But that separation did not stop him from loving you and sending his one and only son to die so you could live, so you could have eternal life. And that's a game changer. That changes everything for us. Knowing that a father would give a son so that you could live, that's a game changer. It changes how we parent. It changes how we minister. It changes how we coach. It changes how we do our taxes. It changes everything because God loved you so much that he didn't want to stay separated from you. So he sent a son to die for you so you could live with him. So that you would never experience hell. And in the chaos, I'm looking out my window right now, in the chaos of an invisible virus, an invisible enemy, that we cannot see, let me tell you, there's hope. And it's the only hope you need, even when that virus isn't there. And that's that question mark. What are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with this knowledge that you were created in love, separated from God, but he loved you so much that he sent us son to die for you? Now, what do you do? Will you trust him? Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and, and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. That's the game changer. That's the beauty of following Christ. It's not about another religion. It's truly not. It's not about a set of rules that, 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 that drive us. It's about a God that would come to earth to die so you can live. The question is, is will you give your heart to him? 
and if this afternoon at 345 <laughs> is, uh, I don't even know what date it is, every day blends together. But uh, if this afternoon at 345 is a moment you feel God tugging at your heart. Then let's pray together. And there's going to be a new screen, Han. But while we change the screen, just close your eyes. Bow your heads. And let's pray together. If you want to pray that this is your moment, that you truly want to trust God to give your life to him, let's pray. There's not a magic prayer. So pray to yourself, but something like this. Heavenly Father, I'm broken. I'm confused. I'm lost. I need you. I'm a sinner. All of sin, I'm one of them. I'm a sinner. I know that you made me. I trust that. But I'm separated for you, from you, and I need you. I'm turning away from that sin. I'm repenting. I'm going away from that. I'm going to follow you. I'm giving my life to you. I recognize that that you are God. I recognize that, that you did send your son, that you came to die on a cross so that I could live. I'm so thankful that that, that, that Easter is just in a couple weeks from now, where we, I get to celebrate that that tomb is empty. God, I want to give my life to you. I know you sent your son to die for me. And I want to turn and I trust you. You know that my only way of salvation is in you, in you alone. I trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. The next screen here is important. Excuse me, I have to use my glasses. But uh, if you've made a decision today, if today was the day that you said, I want to follow, I'm going to follow Christ. I'm going to become a follower of Christ. I'm going to become a Christian. If you prayed that prayer with me today and it was real, here's what I want you to do. Grab your phones and text this code. Take a screenshot if you have to, but text, text the code FCA1472 to this number, 46322. A long time. Go ahead and, and, uh, and do that. Send us that text. When you send us that text, what's going to happen is is over the next few weeks, next couple of weeks, you're going to get a couple of emails from us that from from with videos from professional athletes and great coaches and some FCA staff that are just going to help you in in deepening your new walk with Jesus Christ. Maybe you have been following Jesus, but you've walked away from Him. Text that in anyway. We're still going to get you some good information that's going to help you reestablish. You didn't lose your salvation, but reestablish your new walk in Christ so that you can be more mature. Coach pointed out something. He said, fellowship of Christian athletes. Man, we love sports. But we don't do this ministry because of sports. We do this ministry because we know that you who love sports need to know Jesus Christ. So thank you for being on our first huddle. Coach, I want to do something. Um, and that's why before we pass it over to, to Chris Regan, Coach, I want to do something. I'd just like to pray for you. Okay. Okay. Is that okay? Sure. All right. Father in heaven, God, thank you, Lord, for my friend. Lord, uh, thank you for Coach Bowden. Thank you, God, for the life that he's lived as coach, as husband, as daddy, as granddaddy. God, thank you for the life that you've given him and the call that you've had on his life to be a representative of you. God, thank you for all the, the young men that have played for him over, over so many years, over, over, over decades, and the influence that he had on their lives. I pray, Lord, for your continued protection over the, the Bowden home. And, and uh, Lord, I pray for, for, for many, many, many years of him sharing the story of what you've done in his life. God, you're almighty God. And I want to thank you personally for coach in Jesus' name.
All right, I'm going to pass it over uh, uh, one of our, our ministry advancement coordinator, Chris Regan, has a very quick announcement for you. And then we're going to close out our very first FCA Region 14 huddle. Thanks. Go ahead, Chris. All right. Hey, welcome. Uh, thank you guys so much for being a part of just Coach Bowden and, and his, his just legendary career and really more importantly his life in the Lord that he shared with us today absolutely critical he's he actually shared at my very first banquet in the treasure coast of Florida three years ago and crushed it I have people from our area that talk about it all the time the stories the legacy and the example coach thank you so much um we really appreciate you being on this call so um next week I, we're going to be back here at 3 p.m and so I wanted to make mention I'm going to shift the slide um we're going to be with Steven Matz. Uh, he's a starting pitcher for the New York Mets, if you've heard of him. Um, good friend of mine. Spent a lot of time with him over these last couple of years on and off when he's here for spring training. And just seeing the way this guy has lived his life on and off the field is incredible. And he has an amazing story and how he came to the Lord. And he, he grew up not really going to – he just went to church, kind of went through the motions. You'll hear his story. But how the Lord came in and radically saved him and set him apart through injury, through different things. Um, as you see this flyer, uh, he pitched in the World Series back in 2015 when the Mets were there. And, um, you know, as he, he, is, he is coming into the peak of his career, as many athletes are, obviously the shutdown is, is a big pause. But I want to encourage you, get the word out. We're going to have this all over our FCA Florida social media. Um, and you will go on to the YouTube page that you're on, actually, under FCA Florida. Um, there's a direct link, as you see at the bottom of this screen. But we also, if you just click FCA Florida and go into, you'll see the link is already ready to go live next week at 3 p.m. So we really appreciate you guys for joining us today. Let's continue to press in to all that God is inviting us in to do in a season where everything is almost feeling like it's a timeout. God is working and moving in us and let him, let's, let's allow him to finish what he started so we can see America be everything God's called us to be, let alone the nation. So God bless you guys. Thank you so much for joining us on this call today. All right. Hey, Coach. Uh, I want to do this right here. I want to thank you. I want to thank you for coming on with us today. It's, a, it's an honor for me. It's an honor for me to be in the position to work together. Coach, it's been awesome. I know you people don't know this right here, but you get a chance to. You go and you do, you're involved with FCA in a, on a major scale, and you speak to us in many different areas too as well, and you do it. At, at your own expense a lot of times to be able to help us too. And I'm so proud to be a fellow worker with you uh, in our mission to uh, make disciples. Coach, thank you very much for coming on, Coach, and we love you. Thank you, baby. It's because of you, you and that you you two guys right there and all the other FCA agents, that's why, that's why I work with. Thank you. You take care of yourself. Call them if you need me, man. Yes, sir. Love you, Coach. Love you, baby. Love you. Bless you guys. Have an amazing rest of your weekend. Well, how'd it go?